Hello, and thank you for joining us at the Soul Podcast. We are continuing the second out of two parts of our talk with Jeffrey Kane, author of Samsung Rising. Uh, this time we're going to talk a uh, more modern history about Samsung's battles with Apple, how it rose to uh, be a rival of Apple, and also recently recent scandals, especially with the impeachment of Pak Kin Hei. So, thank you for joining us. Here is the second part. From the land of thousands of instant noodle flavors, this is the Soul Podcast. I'm King Sejo, reminding you that Korea is shaped like a rabbit, with its butt facing Japan. And here is your host, Joe McPherson. Chapter 3 is, I guess, Apple is the uh, main villain in Chapter 3. Yeah, you, you, you know, you're just so good at predicting who's going to be the villain in the next episode, I got to say. And yeah, yeah, sorry to be sarcastic, but uh, yeah, so I mean, next- I'm sure everyone, I mean, most people know about that lawsuit. We talked, we touched a bit on the lawsuit between Apple and Samsung. Um, you know, I this reminds me of a little anecdote, uh, way back, an old friend of mine, um. He was a consultant for a company in Korea. They were doing, uh, I think, web design. And uh, one of their clients was Samsung. And the, the Samsung guys came in there. Um, it was, and they were designing the website. And the Samsung guys kept showing this Apple website. And they said, we want you to do this. And my friend said, yeah, we can do something like that. And they go, no, 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 no. We want you to do this exactly <laughs> for our website. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, but you can't you know no 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 we're samsung we can do this <laughs> it sounds about right sounds mm. uh good story um yeah i think that um that was the mindset you know early on so apple comes out with the iphone and samsung is thinking how can we do this how can we be apple, be apple. Engineer it as quickly as possible Just catch up to them and beat them and we'll be apple we're not just going to defeat them but we will be the next apple yeah um yeah so, you know, the problem here is how do you actually build a brand from a marketing standpoint instead of just making yourself an Apple knockoff? And this is one of my favorite parts of the storyline. Um, Samsung turns to its overseas offices. So, you know, especially in Silicon Valley and also Texas, they have a big marketing office there. Yeah. New York. And, uh, you know, this is where the battleground is going to be between Apple and Samsung because Samsung is a number one leader in most countries around the world, um, but it's, you know, at the bottom of the list in America where the iPhone is completely dominant. So they hired a, a chief marketing officer named Todd Pendleton. And, you know, he's somebody who I met and talked to. He's a really, really cool guy. Um, he's a former Nike, Nike marketer. Um, you mm-hmm. know, he has a good way with kind of words and he, he knows how to communicate something in a way that, you know, he might disagree with you, but he knows how to make you feel, you know, really good about it that, you know, he just owned you. And he's, <laughs> Just uh, he, like he's just he's he's the right marketer you want yeah. if you're going to be a like Samsung about to go after Apple. They got they got Don Draper. Yeah, exactly. A Don Draper, you know, maybe a twenty first, a twenty twenty ten, twenty first century Don Draper. Mm. You know, take away the pipe and the suit and put a spiked hair and a chain necklace and a t you know, <laughs> <laughs> shirt and jeans, like that kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, Todd and his team, they come in and they're working out of the Richardson office and they're given a directive from Samsung that we're going to beat Apple in five years. So they say that's too slow. And then suddenly in the Korean style, Samsung changes its mind and they said, you have to beat them in two years. Mm. And they're like, that's a little better. So then they set out to do it and they defeated Apple in terms of, um, and when I say beat, I'm talking about uh, marketing power uh, mm-hmm. for a while. Not so much anymore. I think it's faded. But um, they they beat Apple for the time being in 18 months in terms of smartphone sales, sales volume and brand power, marketing power. So how do they do this? And this is one of the, you know, I think it's a classic, it's going to be a classic case study one day and how to do what's called being a challenger brand. So challenger brand means, you know, there's always been that one big company. So there's Coke and then Coke is dominant. And then along comes Pepsi, which is the, newcomer and pepsi says 
you know, maybe we can't beat Coke, but we can poke at Coke. We can make fun of them and we can mess with them and we can make them go crazy. So they change their marketing strategy and mess up. And yeah. then after that, you know, maybe they'll come back, maybe they'll do okay, but they're always going to be in the presence of Pepsi. Are you getting a Coke or a Pepsi today? Yeah. Yeah. It, it turns the little guy into an equal player in people's minds. Yeah. 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 So you know, the, the analogy that one of their marketers gave me was that he said, like, look, you're, you're in your first day in prison, and let's say you're a small guy. Uh, you know, you're not going to walk up to the fourth, third, second, and then first biggest guys in the room and punch them in the face. What you want to do is walk up to the biggest guy in the room and punch him in the face because that's your statement of intent. And then hopefully if you do it right, people won't mess with you because they'll see you as somebody respectable who can hold your own. I mean, the other guy's going to fight back, obviously, but you know, you're going to have your own uh, stature and respect among a lot of people in a, in a prison. So mm. you've never been to prison, right? Not prison. No. We'll stay there. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. All right. I, yeah, I wouldn't I mean, want to be the top guy in the prison anyway, because then everyone would be trying to punch me in the face all the time. Maybe that's how Apple feels. <laughs> yeah. Maybe all these big companies are like, do they want to be the number one in the room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, they decide that they're going to make fun of Apple in these commercials, and it's going to be called the Next Big Thing campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, you know, it takes some brilliant planning. It, it's got to be improvisational. I mean, these actors don't have scripts, and they're just kind of ad-libbing things. And it's, uh, it, so what it does is it shows this Apple, uh, you know, like the Apple release, and it shows the, you know, the iPhone worshipers. They're, like, going out the door, and it's like there's this massive nine hour line for the Apple store in Chicago and then LA and New York. And it's like, you know, they're waiting 24 hours in advance for the next iPhone to come out and yeah. you know, all these people. So they're just, you know, they're, they're mindless fans and they're jabbering about like what Steve Jobs said. And, you know, they say like, Oh, did you hear that the headphone jack is going to be on the bottom this year? Not the top. Like, did you hear that? Oh my God. Like, you know, they're going to have a three G connection. And this is like five years old by that point. And then, so there's this guy walking around, you know, he's not in line and he has like the latest Samsung phone. Yeah. And, you know, they, you know, and, and they're like, whoa, what's that? Everybody's kind of like, hey, is that, uh, can you tell us what that is? And he's like, oh yeah, this is a Samsung and it has, you know, like a 4G and it has like, you know, a bigger screen and it has like, and he just tells them like how much better the actual phone is, the hardware and, you know, the display quality and the, you know, yeah. the speed you know, and all this stuff. And, you know, all these guys are just, these Apple fans are just deflated because yeah. they're thinking, like, oh, you know, so I don't have to wait in this, you know, 10 hour line to get my iPhone. Can I just, I can just go to like the local shop and just pick up a Samsung phone that's, you know, cheaper and just has a lot more hardware features. More features. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so true. It's, it's kind of funny how Apple makes such a big announcement about features that were already on phones two years ago on Samsung. Yeah. Or I would even say better about um, uh, Xiaomi. Uh, Xiaomi is usually ahead on the technology. Like I have, I get my Xiaomi. Uh, this thing right here and cool. uh, Fitbits come out with every time the Fitbit much more expensive Fitbit comes out they, they have all these features I'm like that was two generations ago on the on the Xiaomi <laughs> that was that was fine now one thing one marketing I do remember that was really funny was uh, they're poking fun at uh, the Apple Apple culture uh, how they felt like there was some artistic uh, elite uh, and I was like, well, this guy says, oh, I'm an artist. And he goes, dude, you're a barista. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was brilliant. And, you know, it's just, it was hilarious. I remember watching these and I was just cracking up because I also, by then I had bought a Samsung phone. I, I just, I wasn't buying into the Apple hype. I, I had an iPhone before then. And I was just thinking like, this is, come on. I mean, I'm this is. Platform this agnostic. Is, That's what I am. Yeah, I, I was agnostic. And it was, I was just like you. And I, I was just thinking, come on, like, this is not what it's what it's supposed to be. This is not what people say it is. It's not, it's hype. I mean, it is marketing hype. And uh, even internally in, you know, Samsung was doing marketing research and they found that Android users, like they would consider themselves to be smarter and more independent in their choices than Apple users. And they saw Apple users as sheep who just do what Steve Jobs like the new, the new Microsoft. Yeah, the new Microsoft, like all these, you know, with these, what are they called? The Microsoft laptops, these, um, um, like there's a resurgence of Microsoft right now, but even so yeah. in the old, yeah, the, the Microsoft, like the Bill Gates worshipers who loved Windows and like there were the days when, you know, Windows 95 came out. Like I still remember it. I was a kid and everyone that. was like, Windows 95 and they would rush to the store 
and like you could get it bootlegged for you know like ten times the price. I remember that was such a big deal, and they paid they 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 got started up for the Rolling Stones, paid a lot of money for that music, and that was their thing. Started up because that was the beginning of the start button. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was I remember that. Yeah, yeah it's just going back to memory lane of all these old tech. Oh, I was I was a little I'm a little older than you, so I remember I was really heavily into this back then. Yeah. Uh, oh really? Did you rush to the store and get your? Uh, I well, I tried to. I mean, I, I was I was working as a cook, but yeah, <laughs> didn't have the money to go good all the time. But yeah, I could. I was really into. Well, my dad and I were we're big into getting the latest stuff as much as we could. So my dad and I would always we'd share the computer, and and our father son time was every Sunday defragging the hard drive. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, I had similar things like with my dad back in the day when I was a kid. I mean, we'd spend time you know defragging the hard drive or doing the antivirus yeah the antivirus like took you know six hours back then to go through your computer yeah I mean, it was, yeah or you know we'd be uh trying out new games occasionally yeah you know, or tink- yeah tinkering with the computer and seeing what we could do just tinkering with features changing yeah. the background yeah, there was a day when pcs were you know pcs were like the the cars of the past when you know people would like open the hood and be like hey man like, oh yeah the- yeah that was the thing is like i had to teach myself how to te- how to fix a car my dad never did that but my dad and i that our car was computers we would always work on computers together mm-hmm. yeah fun days fun days yeah. i know what you're talking about though. i know the i know the feeling too so yeah um so let's see where was i so uh samsung versus apple so apple people are mind- mindless worshipers and the goal of this so what Todd Pendleton pulls off is that in the end, he reverses the narrative. So there's this wave of Apple supporters who say, you know, Apple is the, the one genius company in the world and everyone else is out to copy it. And, you know, don't mess with Steve. Steve is our man. He's our God. He's, he's Gandhi. And, you know, we're his disciples. And he reversed the narrative. And you know, within about five years of starting this campaign, there was Apple fatigue. And mm-hmm. Samsung had positioned itself as the alternative that, you know, if you, if you're tired of a phone that doesn't really have many features, that's really restrictive and tight, Samsung's your alternative. We can give you every screen size, every price point. We can give you more features, less features. We can, you know, we're going to try to give you software. They tried to do software for a while, but it didn't work. Um, uh, and, Korea, yeah. Korea's not good at the software thing. No, they've never been good at that. But then, even but then also the, um, the the litigation, the lawsuits were dragging out by then, and you know they were on like their third or fourth Apple versus Samsung trial. It was appeal after appeal. It went to the Supreme Court at one point. Um, oh, yeah. The Supreme Court ruled, like so. The Supreme Court had an interesting rule ruling. Like it's been interpreted to rule in favor of Samsung. It really benefited Samsung. Mm-hmm. They, they, they didn't outright say we favor Samsung, but um, they sent it back down to the lower court. And what they said was actually quite historic for the way uh, patent law works. Mm-hmm. So American patent law was written for the 19th century. You know, it's a saddle, a spoon, a cup. You know, these are, these are simple technologies. But when you write a patent today that says, you know, a black rectangle that you can push start and, you know, you can push icons, well, that yeah. can be so many different things. And the courts actually threw out one patent. A- a- Apple actually tried to patent a black rounded rectangle, just the shape at one yeah. point yeah and they threw it out and so there was this fatigue in the industry and people were saying look like you know apple had a strong case back when they released the iphone but now you know there's an accepted design for a smartphone and so many competitors yeah. and apple is just being a patent troll they're just patenting things that are just kind of stupid and they're just trying to create a monopoly and bully everybody else out so they can charge a ridiculous you know price one thousand dollar phone yeah. price and, you know, just turn everybody into these Apple zombies again. And, you know, it's, I, I do think that Apple has lost its luster now. And, you know, there aren't as many Apple nerds as there used to be. And it's hard to tell because I'm in Korea right now. So it's really hard to see from out, from this end uh, how the attitude is in, in, the, in America, uh, how big Apple – because, okay, now I also have a tour business. And most of my guests uh, come from the U.S. or from Europe. And uh, they tend to still have – mostly iPhones that they don't tend to really, I don't really see as many Samsungs. Yeah, they tend to have iPhones. I think I noticed that too. So over time in Korea, they started to accept the iPhone more. It used to be all Samsung. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I remember when the when the first Galaxies came out, like everyone in Korea who I knew had a Galaxy right away, the latest Galaxy. Right away. IPhone. That was a point of pride, though. But I mean, when the first iPhones came out, everyone was going to get it in Korea. And mm-hmm. that's when Samsung was caught with his pants down and then rushed. And then when they found, came out with the Galaxy 1, which is the I, iPhone 2, uh, yeah. <laughs> iPhone 2, the plastic iPhone 2. Um yeah, it, that uh, everyone got that because that yeah, and then then uh, then I th- I would say with the Galaxy two to three, th- this started actually getting better or equivalent to the iPhone as far as features and speed. Yeah, it, it did get better, it, and it was getting better. And also, I think that in Korea there was a um, there was kind of a deepening of the you know just the 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 love of an actual product itself. You know, I think it used to be that Samsung was more of a point of national pride and you just got a Galaxy at one point, you know, 10 yeah. years ago when it came out. But over time, and I saw this up front and personal with my, you know, Korean friends and people I knew there, they, they just stopped caring after a while and they just wanted a good phone. And a lot of them just went out and got iPhones because they preferred iPhones, yeah. which um, I think I, that's, that's good. I mean, cause it I'm, means I've been they, considering they, a Xiaomi phone for my next one. Just, you know, it depends. For me, it's all about the camera. And so, because I do a lot of photography. Uh, on the on the road when usually I can't lug a, a DSLR with me, so I to, uh, for me it's always about the photography. Um, so whoever has the best camera is uh, that's what I go for, and, and Apple always seems to be just like one or two generations behind Samsung with, when it comes to cameras. It is, it is. I actually have a <laughs> Galaxy S9 Plus, so I use a Samsung phone. Sweet. So, um, I should just be clear mine? that Samsung did not give me free phones in exchange for a book that this has no endorsement from Samsung. It's totally independent, but nonetheless, I do like their phones. I think they are the newer ones, especially they're getting expensive and I don't think I'm going to get yeah, the other one. I got the, this is the note 10 plus. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it's great a good camera. Phone. Yeah. Great camera. It is a great camera too. Um, a Wait. little older than this, but you know, still excellent. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. So, um, okay. This is the other, I, we're going to have to, I know I love doing these shows, but they take so long and it's so interesting. Um, I do want to go into the big thing that really got me passionate about this was uh, Elliot management when they started getting involved with the feudal struggle. Uh, So Ikan, he has a heart attack. I'm going to just go ahead. Yeah, Ikan, he has a heart attack. He's kind of, um, he's kind of put in a pickle jar right now. Uh, (laughs) Being kept in a preserved state, um, kind of like, kind of like, uh, yeah, almost it seems. Oh God, Star Wars references, kind of like Rise of Skywalker, Emperor Palpatine, and Rise of Skywalker. Yes, uh, <laughs> being kept alive somehow. Um, wow, the parallels are okay. Okay, I'm not even gonna think that hard. Uh, his, his only son, E.J. Young, um, untested. Uh, but but being marked as the the next one in line uh, has again has a history of just failure after failure, and then gets caught up in the Puck and he, Puck and Hay scandals. Uh, right, uh, so he's in jail. Yes, yes. So this is uh, one of the most brain frying stories of corporate corruption I've ever covered as a journalist. It's it's one of the most perplexing and just like you're it's like you when you write about this it's I just felt like I was stepping into another alternate dimension where like you know people buy horses for each other to you know yeah. get in exchange for them and yeah uh, so anyway so I'll get it so just getting into this so yeah um Econ He the chairman of Samsung has a heart attack in May 2014 he's essentially a vegetable um can't he can he can move his eyes for a while but he can't talk I don't know how he voted for mergers and acquisitions at that time. It's still an open question, but Samsung claims he can vote in shareholder meetings somehow, somehow. I'm not going to speculate because I don't feel like getting sued in Korea He's under those libel laws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe he's just Palpatine sitting on that throne underground. With, with all this fluids being injected into him to keep him alive. He needs oh, to yeah. suck someone's force. To keep <laughs> I'm sure he's drinking unicorn blood or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
There's some unicorn. There's some Star Wars alien <laughs> animal out there that he eats, you know, or that he. Well, that, that's a Harry Potter reference, but yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I haven't seen those in a while. But I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so so but 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 his his, his son is is carrying on the family tradition of bribing government officials and carrying carrying on the tradition of going to prison for it or or being getting in trouble with the law for it but uh the old system doesn't work anymore he's not getting these free cards out well he, he's gotten out now but yeah yeah so just to recap for for listeners so um in 2015, Samsung decided that its uh, company called Chael was going to acquire another Samsung company called Samsung CNT, which is construction, construction and trading. So basically, a company that runs a theme park, the Samsung Everland theme park, which is Chael. And, and they're also the a- PR company, right? Chael is also their PR firm, marketing yeah, and PR. Yeah, this is a different there, – there's another Chael. Um, so ah, because the one based on the Itzy one is the, the marketing one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But this channel, so they have a, a fashion arm, if I recall correctly. They have mm, a, a Samsung a, Fashion. A and so Samsung Fashion is going to acquire Samsung Construction because, you know, fashion and construction, man. They're fabulous. Like, fabulous. Yes. Fabulous. And everybody's saying, why the heck would they do that? And then the merger terms are terrible for the shareholders in Samsung Construction and Trading. So they're yeah. getting one for every share that uh, Chael acquires every one share, the shareholders of CNT are getting uh, one third of the value of that share, one third yeah, of a share. Sucks. It sucks, it sucks. And it's also, so it was technically, do, it was done according to Korean law. It actually was a legal transaction according to the courts because there's a law, yeah. But Korea is not known for really being nice to its to shareholders. It's not known for being, yeah, you're right, exactly. And uh, essentially by doing this, Samsung is, according to the calculations of many independent analysts, um, giving away Samsung CNT for less than zero, just giving it away, mm. if you look at their balance sheets. Mm-hmm. So it's a free acquisition, and they're, they're diverting the value of CNT to the shareholders of Chael. Mm. And when I say share, shareholders of Chael, what I mean is the Samsung heir to the empire, E.J. Yong, who is mm. about to become the next chairman, upon the announced or supposed death of his father. I mean, I say supposed because I don't really know what the state is of his dad now. It's a very strange. So it gave it gave E.J. Young lots of, a lot more shares in the company, close to a 5% stake, you would say, which get, which magically makes people, get, make people have dominant shares. <laughs> yeah. 5% is, means 51% and, and, in Samsung accounting, I guess. Yeah, exactly. 5% makes you control the company. And uh, yeah, so it, it raised his shareholding value and it allowed him to consolidate his control over all these, this web of cross shareholdings. It looks like, if you look at it, it looks like a spaghetti bowl. It's like all these Samsung companies that are just tangled together in mm-hmm. this weird, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I, I feel like I could dip into it and just like pull out a spaghetti you know, meatball and, and eat it. That's literally what it looks like. Take yeah. some time. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Samsung uh, is elevating him to become the next chairman. And there is a hedge fund from New York called Elliott that steps in, which is one of the biggest shareholders in both Chael and Samsung CNT, and says, this is totally nuts. Like, this is totally, like, what, like, who does this? I mean, they was yeah. And, you know, I, I actually met some of these guys. I, I mean, I, I knew some of them and they were just, they were saying to me, like, I mean, can, can we say this is stock fraud? Like, can we actually call this stock fraud publicly? Because mm-hmm. this is basically, I mean, it feels like fraud, but you know, you don't, you're going to get sued if you say the wrong thing publicly. So well, they were accused of being vultures. They were, and they were in the process of this, they got hit with an anti-Semitic media campaign. So I don't know uh, another place in 2020 where this would happen on such an extreme scale, but yeah. um, Korean business tabloids. So there's one, um, there's, there are a few of these things, but there's one like the Mail Chung Jae. They're, they're like business magazines that people read and it kind of, it gives you like the daily gossip on what's happening in Korean business circles. 
Mm-hmm. And they're they're pretty widely read. They they do have a readership, and they started releasing these articles. And they said that the head of this hedge fund, Paul Singer, he's Jewish. Oh, what does that imply? So they said that he's Jewish, and that Elliot, his hedge fund is is run by a Jew, and it's a part of a global conspiracy to subjugate our people. That he said the American government is controlled by Jews. And Morgan Stanley is controlled by Jews, and Wall Street is controlled by Jews, and Jews have too much power, and we're under attack. We're under attack from one of these nasty Jewish conspirators who just want to mess with Samsung. You know, Samsung is the victim here. Mm. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, now publisher of the Korea Times and sole podcast nemesis, Fools Die, uh, was writing stuff like that too at the time. Fools Die, uh huh. Is he a nemesis? He's our nemesis. Yeah. Really? Does he respond? I don't think he knows where he exists, but we've 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 officially named him our nemesis for years. And now we back in 2008 when we started the show, yeah, we were talking about fools die, and now we've watched his rise to power. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's been great, and and uh, you can always count on him for coming out with some very clowny article that's like makes you just just do a double face palm. That he takes really seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, the latest that, one was the ambassador's mustache. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. You did one on, you sent it actually in an email to me. And I, I remember that article too. It was on the, um, the, this merger. And he said, don't mess with us. Don't mess with us. You mess with Samsung, you mess with us. With us. Samsung is Korea. Yeah. yeah. So to wrap up this story. So long story short, the National Pension Service, which is a major shareholder, ends up voting in favor of this merger. Yep. And uh, loses millions and millions of $500 million at one point. Of uh, the public's money. The public's money. This is the pension savings, the social security of the Korean people who are aging and who are going to depend on this pension service in the decades to come for payouts. And that means having strong investments that... That no lockbox. No lockbox for the Social Security. It's being funneled to help a chable spawn become the next heir. <laughs> yes. So, in the end, um, there's a tablet that makes its way to JTPC, which is a Korean uh, investigative news outlet, and they find that there's a mysterious daughter of a cult leader named Choi Shun Seol, uh, who is a religious. So. The daughter is named Choi Shin Seal, and she has bef- befriended Park Gun Hae, uh, the president at the time, who is the daughter of Park Chung Hee, the dictator who we talked about earlier. And they were friends in the, from the late 70s, soon after her mother was uh, killed in an assassination attempt on her father. Yes, yes. And then her father was assassinated. And so, of course, if you were President Park Gun Hae, you've lived a tragic and empty life in many ways. So, the people who went to her house said that it was like a museum. To her father that had stopped mm. in that had stopped in the 1970s and there were all these old you know trinkets everywhere i mean that's how they described it and it's just it's kind of like wow i mean i'm sure that she she must have had something from that so she you know befriends the daughter of this cult leader and this this daughter of the cult leader manages to get just broad access to her uh speeches before they've been uh, put out there to her you know itinerary to like even the fashion she's wearing the clothing she gets to choose yeah. Clothing and all this stuff. And she's like this this person behind the scenes, the Rasputin of Korea, as they Rasputin, called her. Rasputin, yeah. yeah. Like the Russian mystic who infiltrated the, the final Russian dynasty, the Russian family, and helped bring about their downfall. Yeah. So, um, so it also turns out that in the process of this behind-the-scenes woman doing her thing, that uh, the Blue House had requested that Samsung buy horses and give a lot of money to this woman's company called Core Sports, which was registered in Germany the day before the Samsung executive showed up to give her, you know, a few million dollars. Uh, wow. you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I would love to get funding like that. <laughs> well, you, know, you live in Korea, you know what to do now. I know, I need to ask for horses. You could pretend you're a second, third coming of Jesus Christ or, you know. You know what, third. that has been a temptation. You know, we've seen, seen how- <laughs> We have so many cults here. The most recent one in the news is Shincheonji for spreading the virus. But yeah, yeah, just like hmm, 
that's one way to make money is is to yeah, I think I'm just going to say I'm I'm the next coming of Jesus Christ because most all the cults, the leader is the next coming of Jesus Christ. We have you know because he has clones again. Back to the clones. Yes, yes. Back to the clones. Back to yeah. There you go. So um, this is very this is all very Star Wars esque too. I mean, I feel like you know Star Wars is also a Jesus story in many ways. A you know sure. redemption. Yeah, yeah. But uh, okay. So anyway, so it's better call Saul. So Samsung buys these horses for the daughter of Choi Shin Shiel, the the daughter of this friend of the president who is yeah. an equestrian. She wants to be a racehorse rider. Uh, in the Olympics, she's training in Germany in a town called Biblis, and yeah. um, they're expensive. I mean, th- these horses almost cost a million dollars each. They're, you know, they're high end, and one of them is called Vitana V. And it was just, you know, when this broke, I, I was just sitting there thinking, like, okay, so I don't know if you've read uh, Shakespeare ever, but mm. the phrase that popped into my head was "My kingdom for a horse." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> It was a phrase it's from Richard II. Very different context, but yes. <laughs> but uh, I think the meaning of the phrase, it's it's about how something small and insignificant can can suddenly outgrow the kingdom that you're trying to get. So this happens in a scene when Richard II is in battle and he's knocked off his horse, but he has to win the battle and survive. So he goes into this, you know, he has to survive to get his kingdom to become, you know, the next, uh, yeah. like, Whatever. he's desperate so, he's desperate but he's willing to sacrifice the thing he's fighting for to fight for it yeah 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 so he's running around berserk and he's looking for his horse and suddenly the horse matters more than the kingdom if yeah. he's going to get to the kingdom. so uh you know that's something right there that i think samsung could learn a line or two from shakespeare you know they they can just pick it up and check out some of these sonnets because i think they're uh, full of they, should, they should they should they should read it in the original korean Original Korean. It's yeah. a five hundred five thousand year old uh, Goguryeo. Yes. You, you, you don't know. You can't appreciate Shakespeare until it's read in the original Korean. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, and I remember uh, the daughter of of Chaesun Shil was not the the most. Um, uh, I had a few character flaws too. She was a little bit. Uh, you could say princessy. Uh, she, well, that's what the, that's what the thing was. That's why she was going for the equestrian was. Uh, she wasn't that bright of a student, and she had to get into a university. And one way to get into a university, uh, elite university, was to excel in sports. And they were trying to find a sport that there wasn't much competition in uh, that she could try to look like she excelled in. And an equestrian, you need a lot of investment to get into equestrian. I mean, horses ain't cheap. It's like buying cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's exactly what happened, and. She was also, I think she was studying at Iwa Uni- Women's University in Seoul. Yeah, Iwa. Iwa. It was Iwa. Uh, yeah, and, and there were stories about how she wouldn't come to class and, you know, the teachers felt they were being bullied and the students felt that, that, that it was unfair. And that's one of the reasons why all this got out. There was resentment. Yeah, um, she, was, she was kind of mean. She's a mean not, girl. Not, mean girl, mean girl. One of those mean girls. So, um, yeah, so as this comes out, as this comes to the fore, you know, nobody thought that Jay Lee, the vice chairman to Samsung, whose father was in similar straits many years ago and, and you know, did not spend a day in jail. Nobody thought that, you know, he was going to have serious problems. I mean, maybe he would get a scratch and get yeah. out. But in, Slap the on end, the wrist. but in the end, Korea saw the biggest protests in its democratic history. So 400,000 people, I believe, the number was at its height in Guanghamun Square. I was in the middle of it, man. I, my dark side tour walked through it every day, every oh, night. Oh. That's incredible. So we That's, had to we had to wade through the protesters every night. Did they ask you like what you're doing with the tour group in the protests? They we we, like, we just blended in, uh, and and we would collect. Uh, I think I might still have some protest paraphernalia. Yeah, we just collected. Uh, the, the tour guests loved it. I mean, they felt like you felt like you're in the middle of history right then. It was an added bonus. It was really fun. It was yeah. really heady time. Incredible souvenirs. Incredible yeah. souvenirs. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That, that's really cool. That's so cool that you could do that. I mean, have a tour there. Like, I've never it seen was, a protest. I, we were, I think we were the only tour that went through the protest and actually were part of the – one of my tour guides, she actually got the group, like, protesting. I'm like, guys, I think we're violating some laws here by having the tourist protest. 
Let's be careful about it. <laughs> be careful. Be careful. So, um, yeah, but in the end, so these protests are raging and they're saying that Park Geun-hye is going to be impeached. And the prosecutors decide to raid the Samsung Electronics Building and the National Pension Service. And they uncover this massive scheme that shows the, you know, the, the horses going to the president's crony and then the president pressuring the health minister and then the health minister pressure, pressuring the National Pension Service and then the pension service finally deciding to vote, despite knowing that they're going to lose money on this. And then Samsung getting its merger, which leads to E. J. Ong getting more shareholding value and consolidating his control, which you know leads to his opportunity to become the next king on the throne of the Samsung Empire that defines Korea. So this it's this wound up ball of you know powerful interests and people plotting behind the scenes. It's a Game of Thrones type situation where there's lots of, you know, purges going on and people mm-hmm. getting politically cut down. And, you know, it's just, it's incredible like what was going on behind the scenes there. So um, Jay Lee is finally arrested after being forced to speak in front of parliament. And he's arrested for, uh, arrested and tried for three crimes, uh, which are bribery, um, perjury, and uh, embezzlement. Mm-hmm. So three serious crimes, perjury stemming from his alleged uh, false testimony before the National Assembly when he was talking about how he didn't know about this and wasn't yeah. involved, you know, and um, so uh, goes to trial and, you know, everybody's thinking like he's going to get a small sentence. He's going to be let off because he is the leader of this, this nation and, and its company, essentially. Um, and in the end the judge rules that he's going to get a five-year sentence, which is significant in Korea, not a lot in a place like America for this crime, but in Korea, it's significant because it means that he actually has to go to prison. He cannot yeah. get a pardon, or uh, sorry, he can't get a suspended sentence from the judge. And Public sentiment was so different. I mean, so there was just so much against Park and hae and everyone involved in this. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why he got such a heavy sentence. And you know how this works in Korea. I'm sure many people have seen this over the years, that the, you know, the, objectivity, the objectivity of the evidence alone doesn't always define who uh, goes to jail and who doesn't. It's, it's the wind of the moment. It's the Gust of popular people. feeling. Gust of popular feeling. Yeah, like that blog. And that's a great <laughs> blog. It's a great I've one. Read, yeah, I've probably read every post on there over the Matt's, years. Matt's been on our show in the past. Uh, he's, he's a good guest, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Matt's a, he's, yeah, I, I just think it's incredible what he's done, digging all that up. I mean, one of my favorites is the, uh, th- there was a Playboy story during the 1988 Olympics. <gasps> oh, about the people stealing the stuff from uh, the Hyatt? No, that's the thing. No, else. not that one. It was, it was a lot dirtier. It was, uh, it, or no, it was Hustler. It was one of those like dirty, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if it's too racy to say on here. I don't know how. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's let's keep going with the, the, the EJ Young yeah. in jail. Yeah. So um, EJ Young, despite being a convicted criminal and perjurer who is uh, in prison in a solitary confinement, uh, manages to stay the vice chairman of Samsung and uh, gets a board on the Samsung Electronics Board, gets a board seat. So mm-hmm. you know, here he is, and he's like, all right, well, I'm in jail, but I guess I'm still running my father's company. He's so, still um, run yeah. the mafia from jail. That's how it works. That's how yep. it works. Um, so he appeals, and he goes back to – so this is a he, – he spends a year in prison. He's on an appeal trial. And finally, the judge in the appeal trial, the second trial, says, okay, look, well, you know, you um, you did bribe people, but what we're going to do is lessen the amount of bribes that you gave, and we're going to uphold your prison conviction, but you're free to go. We're going to suspend your sentence, and uh, you're, you're, you're free. So get out, get out, get out. Because the attention so, wasn't on them anymore. The, everyone's moved on to something else. Exactly. No one, people aren't paying attention. They're not angry about this anymore. No. And so finally it goes to the Supreme Court of Korea and they say, we're going to do a retrial because E.J. Ong, um, in his second trial did not get a, he didn't get a proper trial. They say, because the judge did not use the correct definition of a bribe when they were talking about the three horses that, you know, Samsung allegedly used to mm. pay off this crony. 
So they expanded the evidence and they said, you must now, instead of one horse, which was the previous trial, we're going to talk about three horses as possible bribes here. And we're going to order this a retrial now. You're going to go back to trial. And now Jay Lee, the leader, is, is in his trial. Um, he's awaiting a verdict, which should come soon, maybe after COVID. And that will determine, I think, the fate of Samsung for a long time, because there is a chance that he might go back to prison. Wow. I kind of, I'm kind of doubtful. I'm kind of doubtful just because Moon Jae-in, the president of Korea, has not been that tough on the Chaebo leaders. He's Even been tough on the to low level. Well, he's been tough on some of the, the – the courts have been tough on some of the executives. So uh, the, the chief of the board of Samsung Electronics, a man named Lee Sang-hoon, has been sentenced to prison for union busting mm-hmm. and a number of other people. So the prosecutors broke into Samsung Biologics and they found – a bunch of computers and flo- uh, and documents under the floor, uh, the floorboards that were being hidden there. Yeah. <laughs> Just so, like Tom Solo and the Millennium Falcon. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. And so they charged a bunch of people with faulty, uh, you know, uh, um, like faulty accounting practices, you know, fraudulent accounting, and they they're charging them for. Uh, destruction, you know, destruction of evidence and hiding evidence and, and all this kind of thing. So Samsung has been in trouble. They're not having an easy time, but their leader is a convicted criminal who is not in prison right now, which is truly bizarre from the outside. But if you're, you know, born and raised and living through a chable system, if you're an employee, I mean, it, it kind of seems normal by now. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Okay. Now this leads to the next thing. Maybe this is how we, I think we should wrap it up is the future of chable. Do you think maybe the chable have outlived their usefulness in Korea? Do you think there's a public sentiment feeling like, okay, they helped build up the country, but now let's go to the next phase. We don't need dynastic corporations holding us up. Uh, do you think uh, a, a company like Samsung could possibly get someone from the outside on the inside uh, heading it up? So I've been hopeful in the past, but I think in the bottom line is that if they were to bring in somebody from the outside, to be a leader who's not a family member, mm-hmm. I think it would upset uh, the system that they have in place. And the system they have in place is that, you know, if you're a Samsung executive who has risen through the ranks all your life, it's as if you've, you know, you've sworn loyalty to this family and its company. And they're the ones who, you know, through their secretariat office, they promote you. They give you raises. I mean, they it's patronage. It's like the old medieval system where, mm-hmm. you know, you swear allegiance to the king and then the king will look out for you. But I think a lot of the older people in there are worried about what that would look like because, you know, new blood at the top means new loyalties. And suddenly, mm-hmm. you know, they might not be in favor anymore by the top leader who's like a god. You know, so, yeah. And I, I also think that they, um, there's a sense of pride. So there's a famous saying by Napoleon that, you know, people don't die on the battlefield because you're going to give them a little piece of ribbon they they die because you electrify their soul. Mm. And among these older Samsung executives, they, they've really been electrified throughout their careers. They truly believe that they are a part of something great and historic and incredible. And that the family dynasty is the pinnacle of you know, this success story that they're a part of, that they look to them as a source of prestige. It's like a national honor. myth. Yeah. Yeah, it's a national myth. It's honor. It's you know, it's um, it's the king who knights you, who tells you to kneel, and then they put the sword on your shoulder, and you are hereby knighted as a mm-hmm. part of this society that we've built that not everybody can get into. And I think that uh, the traditional Samsung executives, they're scared about what's happening in Korea and in Samsung because there are cultural changes happening. There are younger people who, you know, they, they come out of good universities, they speak fluent English or foreign languages, they can get a job at Apple if they want, they can get a job yeah. at Google. They can go to California. A lot of them have come from Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard. I mean, these are really smart people. And, you know, that, like Samsung's not going to be their first choice. Like being Korean is not enough to draw them to Samsung. Yeah, that's, a, that's another side effect of globalization is your, your, your workforce. You don't, have, you don't have a captive economy. You don't have a captive workforce anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's not captive at all. And I think that's where Samsung is headed. I mean, I think that it's not going to be the great company that it was forever. I think it's going to be more of a component maker in the future behind the scenes. They're going to be making Mm -hmm. chips for things like AI. But also, you know, Jay Lee, um, I think it's become kind of clear now in his early years leading the company 
that he's he's not the visionary that his father was. He's um, he's somebody who, you know, you can see him sitting in a coffee shop in San Francisco and kind of talking business with you know fellow executives. I mean, he's a bit more, I guess, gentle, relaxed, kind of you know more um, you know flatter. He's not as hierarchical, certainly. Yeah. Um, but you know that's not something that the traditional Samsung men are going to accept in a leader. They want yeah. fire and brimstone. They want eight-hour speeches. They want passion. They want yeah. pride. They want a fighting spirit. They want mass games and North Korean style propaganda. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it really is a culture clash. And I, I'd be really curious to see where Samsung goes in the next decade under Jay Lee, because on the one hand, he is a, representing a dynasty and he has to continue the, the lifeblood of his family and, and firing up the company. But at the same time, he, you know, he knows that he lives in a new world and he spends a lot of his time in Silicon Valley and he hires a lot of Korean Americans who work mm-hmm. directly with him. You know, he, he comes from a different culture now and it's going to be reconciling, like finding a way to bring those together in some way so it works. You know, it, that's going to be the big test. Like, can we keep our corporate culture coherent so we don't start to just fall apart? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. That, that's a really good insight. That's, um, that's okay. I'll tell you this. You're actually uh, developing my thinking of, of how this all is. Uh, you've actually helped enhance a lot of my views on this. So thank oh. you so much. This has been really good. Oh, yeah. Cool talk. yeah. Um, I think yeah. we're going to wrap it up here <laughs> after two hours of talking. Um, I knew it was going to end up this way. Um, but I will remind everyone, you can get uh, uh, Jeffrey Kane's book, uh, Samsung Rising, on Amazon and, and bookstores, if any still exist, uh, in your neighborhood. <laughs> it's doing very well, uh, and uh, I'm, it's, it's a really good book. I've been, I've been reading it, and it's very entertaining. You have a very entertaining writing style. So uh, I want to thank you so much for being on our show. No, happy to be here, and I, I really appreciate you bringing me on. I mean, Joe, I've... You know, always uh, liked your restaurants. I mean, I remember. Oh my God! Okay, uh, okay, I'm going to be like one of those Samsung people. Uh, you're you're helping awesome. Korea. You're uh, you're really you're really bringing us out. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, trying to put it on the map. That was one of the goals of writing this. That I did. I wanted more on Korea and less on Apple. You know, it's funny. On- like like how we criti- uh, we we tend to be hard on Korea. We tend to be hard on Samsung. But but we're both very we're fans of both too. I think that's what it is. It's like Star Wars fans. Ah, here we go. <laughs> we're very much into, we criticize it, but we're very much fanboys. Of- <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for having me, Joe. You have a good time. Yeah. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. Stay healthy over there. The Soul Podcast is produced by Joe McPherson and is copyrighted 2020 by Zenkinchi International under the Creative Commons license. Parts of this podcast may be used for non-commercial purposes if you remember to give us credit. You can contact us at sejong at soulpodcast.com. That's S-E-J-O-N-G at soulpodcast.com. For a transcript of this episode, Listen to it again, and write down what you hear. Please support us at patreon.com slash soulpodcast.